Hello all, welcome back to ATM5, Our Changing Atmosphere. In today's lecture, we'll be bookending our series with a discussion of climate change impacts and climate justice. In today's lecture, we'll be defining environmental justice and climate justice. We'll be asking, how is climate change related to environmental justice? What are common examples of climate injustice? How can we tackle climate injustice? And what impacts are anticipated in the next century because of climate change? We'll start off today's discussion with climate justice, which recognizes that there is little equity in the consequences of climate change. Since industrialization, global greenhouse gas emissions have increased exponentially, driven by both rapidly increasing populations and associated energy demands. As societies become more developed, there is an increasing demand for modern luxuries, all of which require energy for manufacture and transport. Through the 1960s, greenhouse gas emissions were dominated by the Western world, in approximately equal measure from the United States and Europe. However, over the past 60 years, as other countries of the world developed and came into the modern age, their demand for energy and subsequent fossil fuel emissions have also increased. Today, the United States and Europe make up about a quarter of total global emissions, with China now leading the pack. Nonetheless, a significant swath of the global population still lives in either undeveloped or developing countries. As those countries industrialize, we anticipate there will remain a growing demand for cheap energy. Looking at per capita emissions, a few countries emerge as primary polluters, including the United States, Canada, Australia, Saudi Arabia, and Kazakhstan. These are countries that also have vast natural supplies of fossil fuels, and consequently have been able to leverage fossil fuel extraction to power global industrialization. One unfortunate consequence of legacy infrastructure is the inherent difficulty in transitioning away from dirty energy production when regional economies have been built up to rely upon fossil fuels. Namely, there is often strong regional opposition to transitioning local economies. In underdeveloping and developing countries, there is a greater capacity to impose renewable energy generation from the start. The two plots here show two important quantities whose relationship has slowed progress on tackling the climate change problem. At top, emissions per capita as of 2017, with redder colors indicating greater emissions. At the bottom, climate change vulnerability, which you will recall is a measure of the danger posed by the changing climate to a particular region. In line with our discussions throughout the course on climate change impacts, we see the greatest vulnerability occurring throughout Africa, the Middle East, South America, and Oceania. These regions are also those which are projected to experience the greatest vulnerability because of rising temperatures, shifting precipitation patterns, more extreme weather, and insufficient adaptive capacity. Related to the notion of climate justice, we find that most countries with the greatest emissions per capita are also those that are the least vulnerable to climate change, the biggest exception here being Saudi Arabia. Namely, countries that industrialized long ago and subsequently have been the biggest contributors to our climate uh, crisis at present are also those that are best suited to adapt to the changing climate. These are also generally countries with the greatest adaptive capacity, places with infrastructure and policies that are in place to permit shifting of populations or economic and agricultural productivity in response to the changing climate. In fact, some countries, such as Canada and Russia, may actually benefit from lands that are exposed and may, may now be utilized because of climate warming. Environmental justice and climate justice are two concepts that are common in the literature of climate change that highlight the fact that the impacts of climate change are not at all equitable among regional or global populations. The previous several slides highlighted issues in global inequity brought about by climate change. But even within the United States, there will inevitably be inequity as a result of climate change. Much like richer countries have lower overall vulnerability and greater adaptive capacity, so is the case for richer populations within a single country. If you think about it, if a weather disaster exacerbated by climate change makes an impact in the United States, who are the populations most capable of moving on from that disaster? Richer citizens can relocate and rebuild easily, while poorer populations are more likely to be located in devastated regions and have less capacity to relocate or rebuild. Environmental justice and climate justice are closely related concepts. Environmental justice is more of a general definition and refers to the equitable distribution of environmental risks and benefits 
that is, fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people with respect to development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Climate justice is closely related and refers to the framing of climate change as an ethical or political issue, rather than a purely environmental or physical issue. Environmental and climate injustice then refer to instances where that equity is not maintained. To give a notable example of environmental injustice from the United States, there are many examples of housing that is downwind of an industrial or chemical plant. This housing tends to be cheaper because of hazardous air quality. However, such housing is often the only choice for poorer populations, and so in general we find poorer populations suffer from worse air quality and other environmental hazards compared to richer populations. To give an example of climate injustice, we also find that areas which are potentially the most prone to natural disasters exacerbated by climate change, for example, communities of the Sierra Nevada on the fringe of the wildlands that have become increasingly prone to wildfires, also tend to have a higher fraction of lower income persons that have been displaced by high housing prices elsewhere. In general, both globally and regionally, we find that communities of color, women, indigenous groups, and people of low income experience increased vulnerability from climate change. These groups are disproportionately impacted due to heat waves, air quality, and extreme weather events. Many general examples of climate injustice abound. Here I've summarized some of the examples from Yale Climate Connections addressing climate justice. Communities of color are often more at risk for air pollution, including exposure and response. Seniors, people with disabilities, and people with chronic illnesses may have a harder time living through periods of severe heat. People with limited income and more, are more likely to live in subsidized housing, which is often located in floodplains. That is, these are regions with inadequate insulation, mold problems, and a lack of air conditioning. Language barriers can also make it difficult for immigrant communities to get early information. Some indigenous communities are seeing homes and livelihoods lost to rising sea levels or drought. Also, prolonged drought and flooding can affect food supply or distribution, making it harder for people to access food. Of course, today's youth and future generations will experience more profound impacts of climate change as we put off addressing this severe problem. Here in California, one major example of both environmental and climate injustice relates to access to water in California's Central Valley. Because of widespread agricultural development in the Central Valley, groundwater has become increasingly polluted by arsenic and nitrates from agricultural fertilizers and pesticides. In fact, although California has only 2% of agricultural land, the state uses about 25% of the pesticides in the U.S. However, those living in cities and towns in the Central Valley are largely unaffected by groundwater pollution because water treatment facilities filter most nitrates before the water reaches taps. However, for most rural or poorer populations, disproportionately Latinos, they must instead rely on groundwater wells, which are often unfiltered and more susceptible to underground pollution. For these populations, up to 10% of their family income is spent on buying and transporting bottled water for food preparation and drinking. It is estimated that around 100,000 people in the Central Valley cannot drink water that comes from the tap because of these contaminants. Climate change has the potential to exacerbate these issues. As we discussed earlier in class, future drought conditions have the potential to greatly stress water resources in the Central Valley, make rural wells run dry, and deplete groundwater. As groundwater is depleted, chemicals become more concentrated, which can make groundwater unusable even for agricultural purposes. This is just one example of how climate injustice can work to worsen issues of environmental injustice. So how do we tackle climate injustices? Unfortunately, there is no single solution to climate injustice. In fact, there are entire courses built around environmental and climate justice concepts. However, there are strategies that can frame individual solutions. First, there is listening, that is, giving a voice to those most affected by climate change, either through the media or through political representation. Second, mitigation, which acknowledges that climate change works to exacerbate environmental injustices and that efforts to reduce emissions or pursue a low carbon economy can create inclusive, sustainable development practices and reduce inequality. Third, investment referring to providing means for funding to support underprivileged populations or encourage entrepreneurship to support solutions to climate change. Fourth, commitment and accountability, 
which acknowledges that weak governance, that is, a failure of government to reflect the needs or desires of its citizens, is a major issue in driving inequity. Thus, ensuring that global and regional governments commit to solutions and are held accountable for pursuing those solutions is key. Finally, legal frameworks, which refers to clear language that ensures transparency, credibility, longevity, and effective enforcement of climate and related policies. More information on tackling climate injustices can be found on the World Resources Institute website, linked here. What are the effects of ignoring climate injustices? If we ignore climate change and the socio-political issues that will inevitably arise from climate change, then there's little doubt that there will be substantial global suffering, with much of that suffering concentrated in those regions of the world deemed most vulnerable. Changing weather patterns and higher temperatures will drive up competition for limited resources, which will trigger local strife and conflict. Increased regional famine and mortality will occur in regions with lower adaptive capacity, as crop failures become more commonplace. This will drive immigration away from regions of greater vulnerability and into regions of lower vulnerability, in this case, the more developed countries of the world. Consequently, it is anticipated that there will be a strong political response in these more developed countries, including a greater push for populist or authoritarian responses. All right, that wraps up our short discussion on climate injustice. We've only scratched the surface on research currently underway on this topic. If you're interested in learning more, there are plenty of courses on this subject that provide a deeper and more nuanced look at the subject. Okay, to wrap up the course, let's take a moment and review everything we've learned about anticipated climate change impacts in the physical climate system. Greenhouse gas emissions have the most direct impact on global temperatures via an enhanced greenhouse effect. We anticipate a global average rise between 0.2 and 0.5 degrees Celsius over present temperatures in the next two decades, already one degree Celsius above pre-industrial, and a global rise between 1.8 degrees Celsius and four degrees Celsius by end of century, depending on our efforts at mitigating emissions. Temperatures over land are expected to increase faster than temperatures over the ocean, and increase is expected to be larger at higher altitudes due to elevation dependent warming and in polar regions. Because of warming air temperatures, air is able to hold more water vapor. Consequently, wetter areas of the world, that is, the tropics, mid-latitudes, and subpolar regions, will be subject to greater levels of precipitation, whereas the subtropics will become drier as water is insufficient to bring air to saturation. The increase in water vapor amount is around 7% per degree Celsius, in accordance with the clausius clapeyron relation. Expansion of the Hadley cells may occur as well, leading to an intensified subtropical storm track and increased desertification. Global average precipitation increase is on the order of 3-5% to 5 per degree warming, but the actual change experienced is highly dependent on the region. We haven't talked much to date about ecosystem and agricultural responses to climate change, but it's anticipated that crops will be shifted poleward, and lower agricultural yields will occur throughout Africa, the Middle East, India, and Central and South America. This will play a major role in our networks of food distribution, as well as the capacity of these regions to provide food for their populations. In North America, the regions that are viable for wheat production will shift northward under climate change into Canada, again in response to warming temperatures. Similarly, natural ecosystems will be shifting northward. We anticipate major changes to the forests of the eastern U.S. as certain species become viable at more northern latitudes while simultaneously losing viability to the south. For instance, maple, beech, birch forests are expected to be almost completely driven out of the continental U.S. in the next 50 years. Shifting ecosystems will in turn impact animal populations throughout the country. As discussed earlier, warming is expected to be much larger in the polar regions and at higher latitudes. In turn, there will be accelerated melting of all aspects of the cryosphere, including snowpack, sea ice, and glaciers. The loss of snowpack is a positive feedback process, meaning that by changing the surface albedo from bright to dark, we will further exacerbate warming. Sea level rise will pose an immediate problem for low-lying countries and regions, as well as coastal communities. Sea level rise occurs because of both thermal expansion of the ocean in response to warmer ocean temperatures and melt of land ice from the cryosphere. During the 20th century, sea level already rose 10 to 20 centimeters, or 4 to 8 inches. Thermal expansion and ice melt were both responsible for about half of that rise. 
By 2100, rise is expected to be between 20 and 50 centimeters, or 8 to 20 inches above 2000 levels, although there is large spread in these predictions. It is anticipated that thermal expansion will be the greatest contributor to this rise as oceans warm. Increased carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere will upset the natural flux of carbon dioxide between atmosphere and ocean, driving more CO2 into the ocean even as temperatures rise. This will result in acidification of the ocean as the CO2 is converted to carbonic acid. It is thought that an atmospheric CO2 has already reduced ocean pH by 0.1 since pre-industrial times. Further acidification of 0.14 to 0.35 pH is expected by the year 2100. This will result in coral bleaching and an inability of many ocean life forms to form carb calcium carbonate shells that are essential to their survival. As a result, there is substantial risk of a collapse of oceanic ecosystems. Finally, climate change is expected to make the climate system more extreme. Tropical cyclones, extratropical cyclones, and atmospheric rivers will become more intense and precipitate more because of increased air and sea temperatures. However, the frequency of tropical cyclones and extratropical cyclones may decrease into the future. Wildfire burn area will increase, and in many regions, droughts will become more severe. Billion-dollar disaster events related to extreme weather are becoming more common. The years 2016 through 2019 represented four of the top five years for billion-dollar disasters, with 2020 on track to have the most billion-dollar disasters on record. We are exceptionally confident that climate change is simply making the global climate system more extreme. Climate change is also impacting us in California. When it comes to precipitation, we anticipate a slight increase in annual mean precipitation in Northern California, but little change or even drying in Southern California. Total precipitation is expected to become more concentrated into a shorter wet season, leading to more extreme precipitation and drier spring and fall months. In the mountains of the Sierra Nevada, we're expecting severely depleted snowpack, a 30% decline from present day through mid-century and a 70% decline through end of century. Loss of snowpack and drying of the montane soils will further lead to record high drought stress in montane forests, including wildfire risk and burn area, and a likely transition from temperate forests to shrubland. Okay, that about wraps things up. Thank you all for joining me in this lecture series tackling our changing atmosphere. I hope the course has made it clear that the science of climate change is well grounded in physical principles and that climate change poses a profound risk to humanity in the coming century. We've really only scratched the surface on this topic, but I would hope that with this material in hand, you're well prepared for understanding the latest science of climate change as it emerges in the coming decades. Thank you.